ultimately, I think that right now in our days, uh, technology is a tool for neuroscience. So we want to understand the brain, and now it's a matter of finding the best way to look inside this box and figure out how it works. And there's a variety of tools. So a neuroscientist nowadays needs to just be kind of a master of all of trades. He needs to know how to program. He needs to know how to do math, statistics. He needs to understand a little biology, a little medicine. So, so I think the technology uh, is a mechanism by which we can understand the brain. Basically, technology for me is a tool, but it's a tool that we have to be on top of. So we have to read the most like advanced th things out there to be able to use them. That's one component. There's another component, which is uh, we try to be relevant by uh, using uh, what's out there as a way to explain the brain. I'll give you an example. There's a little part of the brain, a little tiny nucleus that sounds that's right uh, here, here, and here. So it's in the this is the brain. It's right in the center. If you break it apart, it's like being in the center. It's called the amygdala, and this part of the brain has to do with the uh, emotions. This is one of the first parts where your emotion sits. So I studied that for a number of years, trying to understand how it works. Then I learned that there are social networks out there in the world. So look, those two are, are totally independent, basically. But this part of the brain, if it has to do with social uh, uh, like behavior, maybe it somehow correlates to social network. So it took very simple work. We took the size of the amygdala, the size of this nucleus, and the, the amount of friends on your network. Turns out it's, it's highly correlated. So I can look at your amygdala and see how big it is and predict how many friends you're going to have in life, in social network and such. So we also try to use technology as a way to be relevant by uh, explaining things using the brain and technology simultaneously. I heard a beautiful quote by Bill Gates a few days ago. Uh, where he says that uh, people always uh, overestimate what the world is going to be in two years and underestimate what it's going to be in 10 years. So technology advances really, really fast. And uh, for me, this is a positive thing. So I mean, I'm an early adopter, so to speak, and I, I want to know what's going on out there. And this provide proved to be very, very useful for anything. Like everything, every time something new comes out, we use it quickly to, to expand our work. I have a popular lecture that I'm giving about uh, evolution, basically, and about how uh, time frame. So, so first I show a little kind of tree of evolution, where I say, you know, this is how long it took us to separate from this kind of monkey, and this is how long it took this monkey to separate from the chimpanzee, and this is how long, and you, and you see it, it's millions and millions of years. So you say, okay, evolution is really, really slow. In our lifetime, we pretty much know how a human being is gonna look. Like, that's like, you know, there's a small variety, but it's very unlikely that you're going to see a human being with wings because evolution is just too slow for a person. Turns out that we live in a generation where it's not, not necessarily the case. Like, we can now actually speed up evolution. So we can see changes in our lifetime. And here's two ways to do that. There's a biology type and there's a neuroscience type. Biologists now know how to play with, you know, with the, the DNA. So they, can, they can effectively start in the time course of uh, animals that have a uh, fast, rapid generation, they can actually modify them, manipulate them, and make new things, bad and good. That's an ethical thing. That's the, neuro that's the biological part. In neuroscience, we now have uh, the ability to actually enhance uh, the body by attaching devices to it. And, and it's, a, it's a field in research called uh, BCI, Brain-Computer Interface, which says, let's take the brain that's already out there, when it's very plastic, it's, it's adaptable, it changes everything. Let's take the world and start connecting them. Here's simple examples. I had to travel to Germany a few days ago, and I wanted to know what the weather in Germany is. So I went online and I looked at, I went to the weather channel, and I looked and it says it's a minus one degree. This is a number. I had to somehow in my mind go back to a moment that I experienced negative one degree and say, okay, this is pretty much cold. I need to get this. Like I had to kind of use something from my experience in the past memory to recall a feeling. But when I came here, I actually felt minus one degree. So I knew it. And, and this feeling is in my brain. And this memory is also in my brain. So what if I could attach the feeling to my brain in advance? For instance, I would go to the weather channel. I would press a, like the button to tell me what the weather in Germany is. But instead of just seeing a number, I would for a second feel minus one degree right away in my body. I would feel, so, OK, so I need to wear this sweater, this coat, because this is how, what it feels. Now, in theory, it's all there. We know what part of the brain processes temperatures. We know what part of the brain processes sensations. We know what memories. We can actually attach them. We're right now not doing that for many, many reasons, mostly because we're not really good in that level, so we can't do that. But in theory, this is a theory. So we can, this is a manipulation we can do. We can, instead of connecting my, my body, 
to the temperature of the weather channel, I connect it maybe to the stock exchange. So when my stocks drop, I start feeling pain in my back, or when I go up, I start feeling uh, pleasure. And I can connect, so the body is, the, the brain is there, I connect it to anything. And this is like one step. But if you want to go to evolution, what I call human 2.0, we can do much more than that. We can take a prosthetic hand, a robotic hand that's out there, connect this to my brain, such that when I think about moving my hand to the left, so far only this one moves, but then because I connect it also to the machine, wirelessly, the other hand moves as well. Then I connect the other part of my brain, the, the part that controls moving right to the same robotic arm. I think about moving right, the robotic hand moves right. I learned quickly how to control a robotic hand with my body. Now I connect that to my body. Now I have three hands suddenly. One, that, two that I was born with, and one that I just attached, connecting it to my brain and starting to enhance the body. This is something that in theory we, we, we know that is possible. We are far from being able to do that ourselves, but there are people right now, scientists, that are able to help people that lost the ability to move their hands by controlling such robotic arms to their bodies and helping them improve their abilities. So we're already making giant steps towards being able to enhance the body, not just like, uh, not just uh, biologically, but actually from next to the brain. So you can imagine taking some two wings, connecting to the body, teaching a person to control them with his brain by thinking about moving left and moving right, and then having the human being with wings in 10 years, not in 2 million.